Hello, my name is uh, Ndika Gandarias. Uh, I've been working in IT since 2008, and more precisely since 2016, in uh, the Innovation and Technology Surveillance Department of uh, Basque Government Informatics Society. So, how to survive high demand services? Well, sounds a little bit dramatic, no? it's like a dramatic title, but it's nothing that you haven't heard before. Uh, we may do it differently, of course, but I'm sure that we are all looking for something to achieve this goal. And this presentation is to show you how do we approach this problem in a high demand services uh, called Ichuli. Well, a little bit of, co of context. Ichuli is a set of online tools to promote uh, the use of Basque language. Basque government knew that if a minority language like Basque didn't have its spot in the digital world, it would be a problem or a risk for the language itself. So it really was born to solve part of the problem. It can translate from Basque to English, French, Spanish, and vice versa, and also can perform text-to-speech and speech-to-text operations. All these operations are based in AI models, uh, trained with public and bus government data. Uh, most of them run in GPUs, uh, looking for better performance. And to offer a more resilient services, they are deployed in a Kubernetes cluster. But how we manage to survive to uh, this kind of um, services is what I am talking about, what I am going to talk about, not about it truly itself. And to go through the presentation, I will use quotes from the TV series Game of Thrones, because in that TV series, in that show, they have to survive too, and they have to uh, face a lot of threats. So having said that, let's start with a quote from Tyrion Lannister. Well, that's what I do. I drink and I know things. Well, the most important part of this quote is not the I drink, it's the I know things part. And like we all know, uh, knowledge is power. And for us, the power comes from what we know about, about our services. And the first things that we all want to know about our services are numbers. Numbers of requests and IPs. Well, nearly 400,000 requests condensed in 12 hours are answered by, uh, or by these services. Those requests are made from almost uh, 30,000 distinct IPs. And for us, those are, a, those are a lot of requests. And if we take into account that each request prints a, a, at least one log line, well, there is a lot of information to, to be processed. Uh, in order to obtain that information, we have to collect that log lines, and which is the process that we follow to, to collect that, those log lines. Well, like, like I said, these services are deployed in Kubernetes, so we use the sidecar pattern to solve the log collection uh, problem, deploying our applications, with a log collector agent running in the same pod. In our case, that log collector agent is FluentD, but why do we use the sidecar pattern? Well, because we want to deploy the log collector agent like a piece of our services, but detached from, from them, and because it will run in an asynchronous mode. Every minute, FluentD will read uh, the application logs, and send them to Datadog. Once our logs are in Datadog, we can build dashboards and see statistics of the service. And this information is very helpful for us because we can understand how people use our services, and in some point we can decide if we need more resources to improve them. But why do we use FluentD? 
and data log. Well, we use FluentD because it's open source, of course. Uh, it's simple and easy to use and configure. And it has a very small footprint. And this last feature is the most important for us because, like I said, we are running this in a sidecar pattern. So we are, we are going to have this container replicated in all our pods. So we don't want a container that needs a lot of resources. And why that data dog? Well, because it's a cloud service. Um, it gives us the possibility to build real-time dashboards that we can share with people with no technical background. We can perform tests and we can fire alarms from data dog. Okay, Let, let's take a closer look to the FluentD image. Uh, we don't use um, a standard FluentD image. We have created our own one. And you can be thinking, why do that where there are plenty of FluentD images out there, for example, in Docker Hub? Well, uh, we wanted to make it easier for developers to read application logs and send them to Datadog. When developers print uh, log lines, normally they choose the format of those log lines. So we think that they are the best to program a script to read their own logs. And to make developers feel more comfortable with programming that script, uh, we install Node in the Fluentd image so they can use JavaScript to program this script because we think that JavaScript is a more familiar language for them than, for example, a certain script. When they have the, that program, they can provide us, and, and we can provide this, and we will deploy that program in our FluentD image automatically to send logs to Datadog. Okay, but let's take a look to the FluentD configuration file. I will only talk about three lines. Uh, the first highlighted line is where we can set uh, the path of the log file to be read by, by FluentD. Uh, when we run our, our containers, we do it with a T command to, dupli to duplicate the standard output of the container to a log file. So we have to say to, to tell to FluentD where that uh, log file is located. In the second highlighted line, we can set uh, the log rotate command. If we are going to have log files in, in our container, we have to take care of how many log files and the size of them. And in the last highlighted line is where we set uh, the program to be run by FluentD to read logs and send them to Datadog. This is a, a script made by developers. Uh, like, as you can see, uh, we have uh, some, sorry, some uh, default configuration. And in the other hand, we have uh, these environment variables that we can define them in the Kubernetes deployment YAML file. But also, uh, information and logs are the keys. We have to bear in mind a quote from Lord Berries. My little birds are everywhere. They whisper to me the strangest stories. Well, pay special attention to the they whisper to me part. We need a mechanism to be aware of errors or strange behaviors in our services. And we need something that tell us what is going on in our services, that whisper to us those errors. But we, who are our little birds? Well, in our case, there are no birds, but a dog. Again, data dog. But this time, uh, we add another actor to the equation, Microsoft Teams. Well, we live in a collaborative world, so I'm sure that 
you are all using a collaborative tool or communication tool like Microsoft Teams, Slack, whatever. But all daily working tool is Microsoft Teams. So we created a special channel uh, with a webhook configured. And when a, an alarm is fired from Datadog, it sends us a notification to tell us what is happening. And which are the alarms that are fired from Datadog? Well, errors. Timeout errors, service errors, any log line with the word error in it. Too many requests from same IP warning, because we want to know if somebody is making tons of requests to our services, just in case. No activity warning, because we take it for granted that if there are no requests in our services, maybe something is wrong with them. And synthetic text. Okay, here I will explain a little bit the synthetic test. We run two, two different tests. We test our API endpoints uh, with HTTP calls, and if we don't get an HTTP response code 200, we fire an alarm. And the other test is uh, that we test our website making a navigation test. So let's see some examples of uh, notifications in Microsoft Teams. This is a too many requests from same IP alarm. Uh, as you can see, basic information is sending notification, like for example, uh, the timestamp, from which IP were the requests made, and a specific information about the service. In this case, is the translation service. So uh, we are getting how many words were sent in each request. Another example, timeout error calling the API endpoint. Well, uh, in this case, it's an error of timeout. So here we can see uh, what is the timeout that we set, 15 seconds. And the alarm was fired because it took 60 seconds. Okay, with this configuration, uh, we are informed almost in real time uh, of any problem. We can react to those problems very quickly, and we can analyze those errors from the service point of view. But now we are aware of errors, we have information or power, but like Cersei Lannister said, what good is power if you cannot protect the ones you love. Well, and again, Game of Thrones hits the nail on the head. Cersei is right. No matter how much information we have, we need to protect our services. So considering that our services are simple services, our main concern is uh, to minimize the denial, the denial of service attacks. Well. We can let that job to the firewall or to other network control tool managed by other departments, but we love to be able to control the whole service. So at the same time that we were facing this problem, another part of the team uh, was doing a proof of concept with Istio Service Mess. We were not looking for this feature in, in, C in Istio Service Mess, but studying the tool, we saw that it met the needs we had. So the solution was in front of us, and it was to use Istio Service Mesh with a local rate limit configuration. Well, let's take an overview of Istio Service Mesh. From top to bottom, we have the Istio Ingress Gateway, that is deployed in the Istio system namespace is like the core of the of the service mess because it manages all the requests made to our applications. And to configure that gateway, we have to deploy in the application namespace in our application namespace a gateway, a virtual service, 
and a destination rule. Well, we control this part, the application namespace. So the most important resource for us is the virtual service because it defines the route to our application service object and the criteria that the request have to meet to reach those services. Well, destination rule is important too uh, because with this resource, uh, you can tell to Istio what happened with that routed uh, traffic, for example, load balancing mode or TLS security mode. Well, but now we have the architecture, the basic archi architecture of uh, Istio, and now we have to add the rail limit configuration. So, we have deployed the common parts in two different namespaces. The Istio system namespace, where the service mesh itself is deployed, and the Istio common uh, namespace, where the rail limit resources are deployed. I'm not going to get into details in the Istio system namespace because more or less we have already seen that in the previous slide, but just into the other one. Well, uh, to have the rail limit control configured as we wanted, we deployed three resources, the rail limit uh, software and two Redis databases, one per second request and another one per minute request. We split a Redis database in two for better performance because we made some tests with one database and we saw that it was needed for a certain number of uh, requests. Well, in the other part of the slide, we had the application namespace. Uh, like I said before, every application under the umbrella of Istio had to deploy its own gateway, its own virtual service, and its own destination route. With these three resources deployed, applications owners can manage the traffic to their applications. And if they want to use the rail limit control configuration, they have to create a config map object, well, a specific config map object. Uh, we are going to see an example that I got config map deployed for uh, each of the service. Where you want to use our service, we will give you an API token. API token, yeah. Those token, this token is used in the rail limit configuration to limit the number of requests that can be made per second and per minute. But we don't use only the API token. We use a combination of four keys. Uh, the name of the service, that is called generic key, okay. The name of the service, the client IP address, the API token, and the request path. If any request made from the combination of, the four, of these four keys exceeds the number configured here in the right limit configuration, uh, it will get a HTTP error code 429, too many requests from this combination of keys. Well, to see that, I don't know if it's, <laughs> it doesn't see anything this time. <laughs> no. Well, it's a game into the script to make uh, HTTP calls. It's very simple. Um, I don't know if you can see here <laughs> are five threads in, I don't know, five seconds to make one request per second. So if we run this script, okay. With Vanator, finger cross demo. Yeah, you will run this script. We can see that all five requests went well. Okay, let's create that. And we are going to change the ramp up, peri uh, the ramp up period to three. We are going to make five requests in three seconds. So if we run this script, now we are getting errors 
And if we go to see what is the response code, it's a 439 response code. So there is no magic here. It's that simple. OK. So now we are protecting the service from others. But we have to protect it from ourselves, too. So the freedom to make my own mistakes was all I ever wanted, Manch Rider said. Well, we all make mistakes. So how can we earn the freedom to make those mistakes? How can we protect our service from ourselves? Well, what we are looking for here is to minimize the possibility of deploy something that might function or have errors in production. And to do that, uh, we use something called shadow or mirror deployments. And we can configure this in Istio using the virtual service resource. So I'm going to explain this shadow deployment uh, with a graphic. Well, we have our version one deployed in production, running. Uh, the, the green arrows are had real traffic. And when we run our shadow deployment, we are going to have four pods in this case, one with the version one, or another two with our release candidate version or with our version two. But in this case, our rows are in red. That is not real traffic. Well, it's replicated traffic. So users are getting their answers from the version one, but Istio is replicating the traffic to test our new version with real traffic. So we are testing replication in a more realistic way. And we can see if there is some errors, if the performance is better, is worse, and we can decide if that version can go to production. Well, but um, even though we are free to make our own mistakes, errors of course. And we are going back to Game of Thrones, looking for another piece of wisdom, uh, now provided by Braun talking with Tyrion Lannister. If you are lucky, no one will notice you. Well, I want to focus on the no one will notice you. When we deploy something in production, if it has errors or if error occurs, um, the best thing that can happen to us is that nobody or nobody um, noticed that error, or, uh, or at least few people notice it. And how can we achieve that? that? Well, um, in Kubernetes, we can use the rolling update feature, but with that feature, we pass from the version one to the version two. There are no versions uh, in parallel running. So we are looking for another thing. We are looking a way to be quieter, to be stealth. Again, we are using Istio features, uh, modifying the virtual service resource. So we start with our version one deployed in production. And if we run our canary deployment, we are going to have, again, four pods running in production. But now, all arrows are green. The both versions are answering our customers or users. But with canary deployment, we can set how many requests are going to be answered by each person. For example, 80% from version one and 20% for version two. So with this type of deployment, we can control if there is any error that few people notice the problem. And if there is a problem, we can go very quickly. Well, we can go back very quickly. We have to change this value to 1% and job is done. 
But uh, to achieve this kind of uh, functionalities, shadow and canary deployments, we need a lot of different YAML files with a lot of common objects in, the, in, the, in those files. So to avoid to duplicate the files, we use customize. And here you have more or less the uh, structure, the directory structure to, to run uh, customize. We have a base configuration where the common objects are defined. And then we have a directory for each type or kind of deployment. One for the stable deployment, another one for the mirror deployment, another one for the canary deployment. Because between those deployments, the only objects that change are the destination rule and the virtual service objects. So I have a video, but I think that it doesn't see very well. <laughs> Okay. Well, the first step to make that possible is to deploy the two versions. In this uh, video, we have the version one of the application, that is the, um, this one. And we are going to deploy the release candidate version. Well, we have we use Jenkins to uh, to automatically deploy our versions. So maybe let's see. sorry, no, nope. I have to go very quickly. Okay, this is not the video. No, it's not. Okay, no. Well, we can launch the, um, the release candidate version from Jenkins. We have to change the version, of course. And, uh, now we have the stable version. So we are going to change it to release candidate with this version. OK. What is happening? It's going very. So um, now we are seeing the, we are seeing the logs of of the stable version. To make some tests, we are sending from uh, Podman uh, some requests. And we can see in the logs that, well, APA demo temporal, APA key demo temporal is used to make the request. And the user agent is Postman runtime. And it doesn't work. OK. I will put it again. Sorry. So, oh, okay, this is the one. Okay. Well, in the meantime, uh, we can see in, in the Kiali in the Kiali dashboard how is going our request because we have tested from uh, from Postman. But we have configured to a uh, JMeter script to the request uh, without end. So here we have 1.36 requests per second going to our stable version. And if we go forward, well, we have our release candidate here. It doesn't seem very well. This is our release candidate. Here in the tags, you can see version release candidate. So now, the second step of uh, our deployment is to change the virtual service the, uh, configuration to be able to um, distribute the traffic or replicate the traffic between our versions. So we have uh, another pipeline in Jenkins to do that, so where you, you can choose the application to be modified uh, the kind of deployment that you have to do, in this case, is mirror deployment, and the percentage of the request that you want to replicate. In this case, we are going to replicate the 100% of the request. So we will launch the pipeline. Well, 
suddenly we are going to see how this graphic change, we can see, okay, now. Now all requests are going to their stable version and to the release candidate version. Uh, the traffic has been replicated. We can see 2.24 requests per second. And uh, Istio will balance, will balance the uh, percentage of the request to 50-50 because we are duplicating the traffic, we want to replicate the 100%, and now we have the 50-50 requ uh, request going to each deployment. Well, and if we go back to see the logs of the, our release candidate version, now we have logs that are replicated traffic, and to end with this, we are going to launch the Canary deployment. Well, when we launch the Canary deployment, we have to choose how many requests are going to be answered by our stable version and how many requests are going to be answered by our uh, release candidate version. In this example, we are going to choose 70% and 30% to the release candidate, okay. And if we go forward, a little bit more. Well, now Istio is not replicating traffic, so we have 1.70 requests per second. And if, well, they don't sit very well. And here <laughs> we can see, no, we can see it, but um, we will see how many requests are being answered by each uh, deployment. So, we will go back to the presentation. Well, to sum up, um, we have collected data, we have information, so we have power. We are able to be aware of errors, we have a surveillance system we can protect our services from others, so we build some uh, structures to do that. Uh, we protect the service from ourselves. We can test our applications or weapons without problem. And we can deploy applications in production in silent mode, so we can be stealth. So now we have all that is needed to survive in the Game of Thrones. But, like so said as Lannister said, when you play the Game of Thrones, you win or you die. There is no middle ground. So today, we are winning. Let's keep it that way. We have to improve this architecture, this configuration. But, because in the future, who knows? So, that's all. Here's my contact info. Uh, thank you for listening. If you have any question, I don't know if we have time.